Hi, everybody. It's Dr. Eric Balkavage and Dr. Erica Rigelman with the Thyroid Answers podcast. And today we are happy to have Dr. Kate Seuss with us. Hi. She's going to give us some, how are you? Good to see Good. you. Hi. How are you guys? And Dr. Kate Scott is out in on the West Coast on the wrong side of the United States. Where <laughs> okay. it's probably balmy and warm. We're freezing over here on the eastern part of the state. But we are going to have you discuss something that I was not super familiar about. Maybe Dr. Erica was a little bit more familiar with, and that is breast implant illness. And so uh, we are so happy to have you on the podcast. It's a really new topic for us to discuss. Um, but if you could, can you just give the, the listeners a little bit of background about you, your journey into functional medicine, and how you became involved in dealing with um, breast implant illness? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you guys for spreading awareness about this topic. I think that it really hit uh, big on the West Coast because maybe there's more implants out here um, in LA. But yeah, I I was I got breast implants when I was 27, and um, it was sort of a spoof thing. It wasn't for like a large enhancement. I just kind of got talked into it by a plastic surgeon, um, and I went ahead and got them. And after about nine months of having breast implants, and I had really never had any serious health problems. Um, I had a really active lifestyle. I was living on two coasts and flying back and forth and really nothing was slowing me down. And then I got breast implants and about nine months later, I started having systemic pain. Um, and at first I thought it was related to workouts. So I tailored back workouts and then the pain was still there. And then shortly after I started having neurological symptoms um, and other symptoms I could go on. But Long story short, it took me a long time to figure out that it was caused by my implants and I ended up pursuing a health path and I became a chiropractor because I thought I thought it was a musculoskeletal thing. Um, but very early on in chiropractic school, I realized that the musculoskeletal in interventions were not really helping me. Um, and then I started studying functional medicine and it was just like an, a constant um, journey to try and basically figure out what was wrong with me and I wasn't getting any good answers from anybody <laughs> else. So I, th I think that's awesome to, to share your story with people because I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who assume that their pain is, you know, orthopedic or structural or they're just pushing themselves too hard. So they seek out those, you know, whether it's chiropractic or physical therapy or massage therapy and they don't get the results and maybe they bounce from doctor to doctor and people probably don't even realize that something that they consider probably to be safe could be causing them to be sick. So when it comes to uh, breast plant in, uh, illness, what sort of symptoms, wh what would be a, a common symptom that somebody could have that it probably is a lot of different symptoms, but what, what are some of the classic ones? Yeah. And I, to, to the point you just made, I would say that there's a lot of metabolic conditions that could like if, as a chiropractor is, is probably going to be able to give you some relief, but in order to keep those adjustments, like in blood sugar is the first thing that comes to mind. But anyways, we can get into that later. Um, as far as symptoms, the most commonly reported symptom for women with silent ruptures in silicone would be a fibromyalgia diagnosis. So that's something that um, you know is on the research that women with silent ruptures, and you don't really know when you have a rupture of silicone um, without an MRI. So those women, for whatever reason, get diagnosed with fibromyalgia a lot. Um, and that was what I learned first. That made me like, it was like a light bulb. But I didn't have a rupture in my implant. So you don't need to have a rupture to have symptoms. Um, the most commonly reported symptoms are things like body pain, um, uh, anything related to connective tissue. We see a lot of connective tissue autoimmunity um, and thyroid autoimmunity, but uh, the FDA has actually reported that one in 300 women develop anti-nuclear antibodies within three years of silicone. Um, but the problem with that is, as far as a direct link, is that, as you guys know, autoimmunity is a life, it can be considered a lifestyle disease, right? And there's a genetic component. So, you know, the, the experts will say, uh, how do we know that it was the silicone itself that caused the anti-nuclear antibodies? Maybe they started having a different lifestyle after they got breast implants. Who knows? Maybe they were out partying. Maybe the phone was ringing and they were having, who knows? you know, there's a lot of things I've heard. So. <laughs> so how common is, I mean, there's a lot of people getting breast implants. There's been a lot of them done. How common is 
just people getting sick or getting some level of breast implant, <laughs> implant illness, maybe that don't even have antibodies yet, but still have signs and symptoms, well, not feeling well as a result. Yeah. Do you have any idea? And you don't need to have antibodies. I don't have any autoimmunity and I was still like wrecked by them. Um, there's mitochondrial, there's genetic, there's many, there's many different ways that implants can make different people sick. And it's not just silicone, like saline has problems too, but um, the most common things we see are the connective tissue autoimmunities. Um, and to your question, uh, how many people are sick? Well, some people have linked it to like smoking, right? You know, just because you're not sick from smoking cigarettes, does that mean that they're not bad for you? Does that mean that they're not going to eventually cause problems? Um, it, it's very hard to quantify the answer to that question. I, I would imagine that there's a lot, a lot of it's unreported too, you know, there may well, be yeah, they were, like that too. Yeah. They, I think that uh, if you were to try to report symptoms like that to a medical doctor, they would refer you to your plastic surgeon and then it would be the plastic surgeon's responsibility to report those to the FDA. And I don't think that's happening. And I, you could guess why. Are, are the plastic surgeons in denial about this <laughs> or are they, are they but, acknowledge that this is a possibility? There are some plastic surgeons that are really getting on board. And um, I know Dr. Jay Chung in Newport Beach, who was the surgeon who removed my implants. In his practice, he only does implant removals. Um, he's not doing any other types of surgeries aside from like, you know, the cosmetic lifts, any like breast related things. Um, he actually testified before the FDA about his uh, findings in, in practice and his feelings about it. And his testimony is on YouTube. It's, it's excellent. Um, he is a really brilliant surgeon and he only does removals now and I believe he's booked out about a year. Um, there, there are several doctors like spread out around the country who have really dedicated their practice now to this. Um, more are getting on board. I think some of them are getting on board because they see that there's a financial opportunity. Um, but it's very important to go to a surgeon who understands the proper removal techniques, especially if you're very ill, especially if you have a rupture, um, because the silicone is very sticky and it's very migratory, um, especially the old silicone. So when they just, the, 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 the usual way, um, they won't do what's called an M-block cap capsulectomy, so they'll just cut into the, into the skin and then they'll cut through the scar tissue capsule and they'll just pull the implant out, right? Like a bag um, through that little incision. And what happens is that scar tissue capsule, which has adhered around the implant, and it's sort of been like a sponge, which is absorbing all of the, the, the lead and arsenic and platinum and aluminum and all the heavy metals in them and all the neurotoxic chemicals over many years. And then they, they'll leave behind that scar tissue capsule. So women who, who have a, you know, um, some of these more severe autoimmune presentations often won't, won't get better um, when they leave that behind. So you have to go to someone who understands how to remove the whole thing. Like an envelope. All right. So let me, let me back up for a second. <laughs> okay. got a couple of so anybody who has chronic health issues and who has had breast implants probably should at least have an assessment or consider that the breast implants could potentially be contributing to their chronic health issues, right? Yes, absolutely. And so when we talk about we talk about breast implants and we talk about, you know, how do we, do we have any idea of numbers of people? It's really estimates because there really isn't a definitive test to say you are sick because you have uh, a breast implant or a, a reactivity to the breast implants, correct? I would say there's a couple of things that would be like ominous signs and if they have certain particular like genetic um, mutations or certain markers, yeah. But those would but, be susceptible. That may make them more susceptible. Well, let's get into that in a second. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so we've got a person who's sitting at home who's saying, "I feel terrible. I feel lousy." Yeah. Uh, we talk many times that, and I, I'm I'm gonna imagine that many of the symptoms that they may feel are the same symptoms that we're gonna see in the thyroid world of mm -hmm. people who are chronically tired, fatigued, achy, mm -hmm. they don't feel well. They may have many of the symptoms of hypothyroidism because as yes. Dr. Eric and I talk all the time, yes. hypothyroidism is a cellular event. So if you mm -hmm. have some type of physical, chemical, emotional, or microbial stressor, Yes. In physiology, the body's natural response to that, number one, is to downregulate 
uh, thyroid physiology within the peripheral cells. It's a yes. mechanism. Um, and then long term, we typically start to see the autoimmune attack on the thyroid gland to shut down the global metabolism as a defense mechanism. So for the patients that we may see, or the patients that you may see, if they don't feel well, and they've had breast implants, it's probably something that needs to be investigated as a potential trigger. Is that fair to say? Yes, absolutely. And I think that that can happen in different ways for different patients, but I love the way you explain that. And I would say in somebody who has a genetic predisposition towards thyroid autoimmunity, you're going to see the silicone almost being immune reactive, right? Turning on that autoimmune thyroid. So in those patients, you're going to see a really obvious autoimmune attack, like usually the antibodies are very high and they're very affected. Whereas in other patients who maybe don't have genetic autoimmune susceptibility, it's exactly what you just said. They can still have autoimmunity because of the onslaught of chemicals and heavy metals. And especially if there's, you know, um, if their liver is burdened, if their lifestyle involves other habits, you know, um, alcohol, uh, um, you know, pain, you know, a lot of times women are on painkillers to manage the pain that they end up getting. And, you know, so they get into the system and they get a lot, they get on a lot of stuff. So it's not like um, taking the implants out is for some women, a magic bullet. uh, It's, it's overnight benefit. And in other women, it takes them a lot longer. And um, especially if, yeah. I I would imagine Mm -hmm. that after you take the implants out, they're there has to be a level of healing that has to take place in the body because it's not just because that's gone, it's completely out of the system because it probably has already migrated to all the lymph nodes. It's probably sitting in the liver. It may even be in the neurological tissue. So there has to be a level of detoxification or just letting the body heal itself that has to take place after that for a lot of women. And I think would imagine they have to understand that this is a long-term process, not a quick fix that they're looking for. Absolutely. Um, but, and, and, and anything they do to try to feel better or get better prior to removing the implants is going to be like swimming upstream. So it's going to be managing symptoms and they're still going to be dealing with that daily um, burden, that toxic burden on a daily basis. So, so yeah, we, we encourage all, all of our you know, listeners and our, obviously our patients, you know, we look at all avenues of life that could be creating toxicity. You know, it's no different than a dental implant that maybe is leaking metals into the system or you know, the breast implants. You, you have to look at all of the factors that are you know, filling their toxicity bucket Um, that could be leading to them being more sick. Yes, absolutely. So Dr. Kate, so people, just so we're all clear, when they have breast implants put in, the breast implants, and we can talk about the different types if we need to, but the breast, the different, the breast implants themselves actively can leach toxins into the environment. Is that whether they burst or they don't burst, they can still leach toxins into the environment, right? Yes, absolutely. And there is something that the FDA talks about, which is called implant sweating, I think is the kind of term. Um, And it's basically a microscopic gel bleed. So when I took out my implants, um, they were sticky to the touch. I did a, a little video on my Instagram about this, but um, we, the surgeon cleaned them and then they weren't sticky anymore. And then we put them in a bag and a couple of days later I took them out and I'm feeling them and there's a sticky texture when you handle them and then touch your own fingers, you can feel it. And um, The FDA said that they tested, they have tested um, the contents of the sweat and that the levels of platinum and other things are clinically insignificant. That's their official stance. <laughs> but I have no idea how you can quantify that over like years in different people's bodies and different temperatures. But I do, when women have implants, um, I do uh, discourage them from using certain types of sauna where the depth of, of heat, and, and usually these patients get so much benefit from sauna and they feel so much better after. But I, yeah, I, I, I think that there's a potential that you could exacerbate implant perspiration by doing um, certain types of infrared where the depth is deeper of the, of the light of the heat ray, right? So this kind of builds on what Dr. Erica was saying. You got these things that are constantly giving off some low grade of chronic toxicity. That when we talk about the things that can trigger hypothyroidism, whether it's cellular or glandular and trigger autoimmunity, that's a perfect thing that's constantly slowly just leaking out of, into the system. And while 
the FDA has not come up with an allowable or, or saying that within the <laughs> clinically allowable, significant, you know, clinically significant, <laughs> clinically significant to what? To cause cancer, to cause an overt pathology. They right. still might be uh, significant enough when you're leaching these chemicals that the body should not have in them into the system that it's still enough to create low level stress response that's going to activate what Dr. Eric and I talk about is that cell danger response, deactivate thyroid hormone and create most of that chronic symptomatology. Because as we've talked about on the other podcast, anytime you downregulate cellular uh, thyroid physiology, you downregulate cell metabolism. And then when we're talking about, hey, my muscles ache and I can't maintain corrections when I get adjusted or physical therapy, if you don't have cellular metabolism functioning appropriately, especially mitochondrial function. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, no, and it's not, it's so that that's like one thing that's happening. Okay. That's one thing that's happening, but then you have to layer all of the other things. So like in my case, I have an SOD2 mutation, which means like genetically I have the potential to make less of that enzyme, the super oxygen and uh, dismutase inside my mitochondria, which removes free radicals every time my cells do uh, anything, right? Any type of um, Krebs cycle cellular respiration, right? So um, if, you know, it's been shown that mercury and other, and uh, right, this, this combination. So when all of those are together, even in someone without that genetic um, lessened amount of the enzyme, they can still lower that enzyme uh, ability less, you'll have less of that enzyme, which means you're going to not be able to uh, get rid of these toxic metabolites. So then what happens? Well, usually this, you have cell death. You have more cell death, um, which means less mitochondria, which means less energy. And that's not even looking at the thyroid aspect and the metabolism. We're just talking about having physically less cells and then less insulin receptors so the blood sugar can go higher. Um, yeah. So it's very, it's very interesting. Yeah, I think when we start talking about those things, they they all tie into that aspect of what's going on, and um, and we definitely talk about the the effect of cellular hypothyroidism and the impact that it's going to have. Um, and, and I don't, and we've talked about this in the past on the other podcasts. We look at that not necessarily as a mistake by the body. We look at that as a way for the body to actually and the cells to actually defend themselves. If you slow down uh, or deactivate thyroid hormone, then uh, you're your mitochondrial production of energy goes down and now you start to increase or ramp up your, your defense mechanisms and increase oxidative stress. Yes. One key aspect that, of that as well is when you deactivate T4 to reverse T3, you free up iodine. What's, the, what's one of the strongest antimicrobials in the body? Uh, iodine, right? So yeah. is that a mistake or is that actually you know, the innate intelligence of the cell's way to try and defend itself and say, hey, let, we need this iodine to kill something, right? And now it's not going to necessarily have that impact from, uh, from the breast implant and the toxicity it's giving, but the cell may not really fully realize what the stressor is. It just realizes a stress, right? Right. And then think about the burden on the immune system over time. Um, yeah. Absolutely. It's not a... So is there a difference between the type of implant? So if somebody's listening to this and they say, well, I, is she, is she talking about silicone? Is she talking about saline? Does it make a difference? Yeah. The type of implant, is there a difference? Yeah, so we're talking about silicone. We've been talking about silicone, but saline can be extremely problematic for different reasons. So the way the old saline, and, now, and nowadays, the new saline implants have a silicone shell. So they're basically, they're, then it will be the same discussion. But in the old saline implants, it, you know, you have something that's sort of similar to plastic as the shell. Um, and then they have a valve that they fill using a bacteriostatic system with saline, right? Um, so what we are seeing in some of these older implants when they come out, especially in women who are extremely ill, is sometimes those valves become semi-permeable. So you have pathogen activity inside of the implant, which can create like a mold breeding ground. Um, and so, you know, just quick anatomy, like you have right here next to your heart and your lungs, you have a ground zero of a mold infection um, right next to your vagus nerve, which um, I know a lot of the new research is showing that we're seeing the vagus nerve and pathogens implicated in all kinds of things like mast cell syndrome, um, uh, chronic EBV, and, and so on, um, because those mast cells lay right here near the vagus nerve. So when the vagus nerve is getting assaulted by pathogen activity, they're having all kinds of reactions. Um, 
which and, and, and systemic health problems. So, so I wouldn't say saline are better, but I would say that I've seen women who have obvious autoimmune history, family history, um, being discouraged by some surgeons from getting silicone and they'll say no to saline because you have this autoimmune stuff going on, which is pretty cool that the surgeons are, some of the surgeons are thinking like that. Um, but you're still putting something inside the body that's foreign. And, you know, we're talking about not drinking out of plastic bottles. And then you're thinking like you have plastic inside of your body, I, you know, so it's just, it's sort of counterintuitive, right? How, how similar is saline to plastic like materials? I'm not too familiar, familiar with saline being a toxin in the body. Does it also- No, no, it's, it's the shell. Yeah, not the actual saline. It's the shell around the saline. Gotcha. But I think the biggest problem is that semi-permeable permeable valve, which is not supposed to be permeable, but it oh, is, sure. and things can get through there. Mm-hmm. Is, and the, then is, is the saline also cause hormonal issues similar to what like plastic does in the body as well? Or I mean, there not been a lot of studies on the link. Yeah, I, I honestly don't know. Um, all I can say is that I've seen many women with saline implants very sick. I would, prop. I would my my best link for that would be related to pathogen activity inside of, um, but I think that there's definitely problems with, so, so the, the thing is, the thing is like with silicone, they use these chemicals to cross link it and create like a cohesive, um, kind of like, like, I don't even know how to describe this, like a cohesive, and in the old silicone, they had problems with this process. So the silicone was super migratory. And that's why in some of the women who've had implants for 20 years, when they come out and they are ruptured, we see that silicone sticking and moving, right? And that was why the FDA took them off the market. Um, there used to be a lot of implant manufacturers who were using all kinds of stuff. I've even heard in South America, things like um, uh, commercial silicone, not medical that was being used, uh, which is really scary. So the FDA kind of was like, guys, this is crazy. They took all of them off the market. And then two companies, I think Mentor and Allergan, um, they did some studies and they reformulated their silicone and made it more cohesive and then they put it back on the market. And now we have even newer coat that, uh, I think it's called, um, it's like me- memory foam or something like that. It, it's of the cohesive gel gummy bear that they say you can cut it with a knife and it won't rupture. Um, the problem is that I, I believe to create that type of product, they had to add even more chemicals. Yeah. So I think that's why we're seeing those silicone implants being so much more immune reactive and toxic than the simple like plastic outer part of the old saline. So I think in saline, the pathogen activity is probably the primary issue um, because of the proximity to the vagus nerve and, and so on. With that being said, I'm sure the plastic has chemical you know, issues as well. So we, have, so we have really potential from the shell, the coating, potentially creating problems. And then there, what, what's inside it, the saline may be less reactive in the body because it is saline versus the silicone, which is just made of all kinds of potential neurotoxins that can, once they leak out of that shell or sweat out of that shell, can Or rupture, exactly. Or rupture, yeah, can, can create a number of issues. Okay. Exactly, yes. So the, where do you see, um, where do you see the kind of the start point for somebody if they're chronically ill, chronically sick, they're coming to you, they've heard some of your information, they say, I'm chronically ill, nobody seems to be able to figure out what's wrong with me. Um, what, how do you a- assess them? What's your process to helping somebody like this? Um, they've heard your information, they, they say, I got breast implants, how do I know if that's what my issue is? Right. Should, I get them well, out? should I do them right now? What should I do? Yeah, so, well, first of all, I will have to share that within my medical journey, I saw a lot of doctors, and any of them were natural alternative practitioners, and nobody asked me if I had breast implants, and it wasn't something on any of their intake forms. So I would encourage doctors, who don't think about that to think about that and have that on their intake form. I think now it's going to be unavoidable where all it's, all this information is coming out, but for a long time, that wasn't even something people thought about. Um, So that's step one. And then if you already know that implants could be an issue. So what we see a lot of now is these women, by the time they're ready to explant are so sick that like just preparing for an invasive surgery is terrifying and their anxiety is through the roof. Um, 
because it's a scary process, but also because their body has been primed for anxiety because of all the chemicals and, you know, uh, extra opening of calcium receptor channels and possibly hyperactivation of NMDA and like hyper, like it, it affects the nervous system, the chemicals and, and many people. So just trying to get ready for that surgery can be so traumatic and scary and they have immune issues. So I would say preparing for surgery. Um, once you get within two weeks of surgery, you have to back off on a lot of herbs and there's a lot of things you can't take because of blood thinning. But if, if you're waiting for one of these top surgeons who's booked out three months or six months, you know, then you have that good window of time. You can really start working on immune health. You can work with a functional medicine practitioner to, and again, it's going to be swimming upstream, but at least you can try to get your body healthy for surgery. When you're already having chronic illness, then you have to go through a major surgery that, you know, that can put somebody in an even more disadvantaged state to then recover oh, from absolutely. the surgery. Not to yeah. mention of healing from the surgery itself. I mean, that exactly. takes a while, but then, you know, factoring in anesthesia, which if you already have an empty yes. heart defect, yes. just right there just puts you at risk for, you know, negative mm -hmm. reactions from that. Absolutely. Um, so I think that they're working with somebody who is knowledgeable in, you know, post-surgical recovery from that, I think it's going to be really, really important. Yeah. And then they have to decide if they want to consent to having antibiotics in the IV during surgery, which is a new hot topic. A lot of women I'm seeing are absolutely declining that and the surgeons are making it optional. And then they have to decide if they want to go on antibiotics after surgery. Um, if, if they are one of the people who have mitochondrial defects, like we're very concerned about certain antibiotics like Cipro and Levoquin, which um, for some reason is in some surgeons practice like standard, that's what they go on after surgery. I have no idea why. Um, <laughs> but, you know, being knowledgeable about all of these things and, and being able to, to work with somebody who really knows is so important. It can make all the difference. Like if you're suffering from an SOD2 mutation and you already have breast implants and then you go under surgery and then if you were to take a fluoroquinolone, like, you know, it, it, it could be catastrophic. So if for the for the person who's struggling, right? Is there something that, are there key things that you look for in their history or their blood work? You say, hey, you're chronically ill. Nobody's been able to figure this out. You've got some breast implants. There's a high probability that there's a problem from the implant. Is there things from a testing perspective that clue you in that that is the cause? Or do you just feel in general, probably not a good if you're chronically ill get this potential toxin yes out of the system Is that yes important? if you're chronically ill you absolutely have to remove like things that could be triggering it and that's not just breast implants you know that could also be like you mentioned before amalgams um but you know i've also seen people who don't think they have any symptoms who have removed their implants just because they wanted to, they just started to feel like it was a bad idea. Like one of my patients who was a mother, she was breastfeeding and she was like, I don't really want to have any more kids with these inside of my body. Um, she said, I'm not really having any symptoms. I don't have any pain. I feel okay. She had gained some weight, but she thought it was from her baby, right? Um, she took her implants out and within like, like a month, she had lost 10 pounds, like her whole face looked less puffy, less inflamed. And she was like, whoa, this is, you know, amazing. Like the inflammation that was there, which we think was probably coming from the implant. So. So the problem is, is that you don't know what good is because you're associating it with yeah. what the norm is, right? And if you feel relatively the same every day and you're getting by, you may say, I'm pretty healthy. And my, when I go see my doctor, Everything's normal. <laughs> yeah. How many times do you hear that? My doctor all, all, all the time. time. Everything is normal. Okay. <laughs> I was normal too. Yeah. yeah. Right. Still normal. And there and there's two issues, right? That we can add to there. One is what gets measured gets managed. So if your doctor's not looking at complex panels, uh, they're running the insurance-based limited panels. And if your doctor's looking at disease ranges or what we call lab, right. Ranges, right. a lot is missed, right? Right. So for our listeners, are there are there some key, are there some key labs that you really like maybe to see and say, hey, you've got a, this is a chronic inflammatory issue or something that is kind of points to a problem here? Yes, of course. Um, we can look at inflammatory markers, but they don't necessarily have to be elevated. I, in some patients I see very, I really just see sometimes HDL is the only thing that I'm seeing is a little skewed. And I, I take that to be inflammatory, especially depending on like correlating that with their lifestyle and what I know they're doing and not doing. Um, 
unless they're having like a really acute, and that's another problem I think is that by the time these women get really bad, um, and you know, men get silicon put in their body too, which we're not talking about today, but there are implants for men that are silicon based. And I don't know the ingredient list, but, but that's something to think about. Um, by the time they have extreme dysfunction and they're in with a rheumatologist and they're getting diagnosed with connective tissue diseases, and it's almost always some mysterious connective tissue disease, um, not like a slam dunk one, but they're just like, oh, we're seeing, we're seeing auto, uh, autoimmune markers and we're seeing evidence of connective tissue, but we can't say it's lupus and we can't say it's this. So we just kind of, um, they usually have high inflammatory markers as well. Um, they're, they're the ones with CRP and ESR uh, dysfunction. Um, but if they're not, and then they get diagnosed with that thing and they're like, oh, I have, an, I have a connective tissue autoimmune disease. And they're not thinking, oh, maybe my implants turned on that gene and maybe it's going to be impossible to shut off without removing them, right? So, um, I yeah, and I like to look at, like, like you mentioned, MTHFR is going to give us a really good indication of how well they're able to detox heavy metals. Um, also, how quickly they're going to recover if they might be a candidate for chelation, which not everybody is. And if you're an autoimmune patient, I don't really like to recommend chelation. So, did I answer your question? <laughs> so, I, I think so. You might look for some of the you might look for some inflammatory markers on some of those patients that are coming in. See if they're elevated, but they don't always have to have, you know, the, the classic acute inflammatory markers like CRP and. And uh, I know I see that in practice. A lot of times people have chronic inflammation, but CRP is, is, is actually normal. And they may actually have a suppressed ability to, to produce CRP, uh, depending on what's going on with them. But there Absolutely. Is another, there's another of a, a number of other markers we can look at. If, if you have if your insulin starting to elevate, if hemoglobin A1C is starting to elevate, oh, yeah. if acid starting to elevate, if homocysteine is starting to elevate, if fibrinogen is starting to elevate, if mm -hmm. ferritin is starting to elevate, if uh, you have higher levels of 125 vitamin D than your 25 OHD, uh, if your magnesium is deficient. So there's a lot of markers. And so you'll look at some of those things potentially to get clues to see if a pattern is there. And then you also want to look at somebody's genetic information if you have that, right? So yes, all of that would be very helpful. Um, and also looking at the timeline of their symptoms, because that's something that patients don't necessarily put together. Um, I didn't even put it together until I started learning about silicone and fibromyalgia diagnosis. I started thinking, oh my God, like I started having all these health problems nine months after I got implants. How hard is it for <laughs> certain patients that you work with when you're going through their history and, and you're suspecting that maybe it's their implants? Is there a, a, a majority or a minority of patients who are kind of in denial? I mean, I know working with patients, you know, there's certain things that you suggest, like if I say gluten maybe has to come out of your diet, or maybe it's this product that you're using in your, your home or your environment that we've got to remove and, and they're kind of in denial that they, that that could ever cause them health issues. Is there, is there a level of denial that goes on with some patients? Absolutely. I see that so much. And, um, it's a really hard thing to accept. And you have to think about the reasons why people get breast implants to begin with. Um, at some, at sometimes there's cancer involved. Sometimes they've removed everything and then they put in an implant. Um, you know, but the way I think about it is I, it's my job to give my best advice and tell them what I think. And if they have a, a complete, um, just disassociative response or they just don't want to have anything to do with that advice, it's fine. Because I know sometimes it takes five or six people or different information sources to kind of give somebody that acceptance. So if I have to be the first person in a line of five before they're ready to accept that, um, you know, that's, I've played a role, right? Um, but yeah, I've, I've had, I've, I've definitely encountered that and I understand that, you know, I have compassion for why that happens. And I, I wouldn't find it hard to believe that somebody would come, Hey, I'm chronically ill. I've seen a bunch of expert medical doctors and nobody knows what it is, or it's some type of autoimmune condition. So it's idiopathic. We don't know what it is. So it's nothing you can do. And Just then, take Plaquenil. That's all you need right, to do, right? right? That's it. And then they get to you and you say, hey, there is, there's a probability that this toxic substance you put in your body is probably at the root of your issues. Um, I can see where somebody would say, mm, I don't know, because these other experts told me it wasn't. I mean, we see this on an easier level with what, like Dr. Eric was saying, was gluten. Absolutely, gluten does not create any reactivity in people unless it creates celiac disease. Really? Um, there, 
it, we, we already kind of know the difference that that's not necessarily the case, right? It's not necessarily the case, a problem for everybody, but it can trigger other immune inflammatory cascades. So I can definitely see where people would be like, you want me to take my boobs out? I mean, I, yeah. just, I just put them in. The crazy thing is we're taking, when you're talking about who gets these, and I feel terrible for the people who had breast cancer, they take out their own breasts because there's disease and damage there. And then you put in a toxic substance to replace the one that was already challenged and the tissue. Right. In a person predisposed to cancer. Wow. And, and also what we, unfortunately, there's a type of implant called textured silicone, which means that the outer part of it has, it almost feels like sandpaper. Um, and I know that that's a common implant used in, in the, in the breast cancer patient, because when they remove all of the tissue, they, I think they think that the textured silicone is better to have close to the surface of the skin because it's going to seem a little bit more natural. Um, and be, because of that texture, um, there, we, the, the theory is that there's more pathogen activity and ability of pathogen to attach and, and, um, that type of implant has been like definitively linked to a rare type of uh, lymphoma um, in a population study in Finland, which has been all over the news. And um, I, I don't think they're using textured implants now as much. I mean, this study just came out a couple of years ago. So that's really scary to me um, that, that that's a really go-to implant in cancer patients. So, yeah, I, I, yeah, I think the whole thing is a little nerve wracking. Um, now that we're talking about it. So let me ask you a question. If somebody's listening to this, they've realized that maybe their breast plants, breast implants are part of their problem. They're considering getting these taken out. What, what do they need to know? I mean, just go in there and <laughs> Besides have everything we've already talked about. Yeah, I mean, okay. Yeah. I mean, what is their doctor? They need yeah. to go to the doctor and say, hey, we're just going to take them out. Every, life's good. Um, but my guess is, based on our conversation so far, you're going to say, that, hey, there's some other things that you're going to need to do either before or after that are going to be important that your doc might not talk to you about. Yeah, I, so there's, there's, been, there's a lot of fancy detox programs. I know that these women get targeted as well. Um, you don't really need, I actually would discourage people from doing an official detox after surgery immediately because... Um, it cannot create like a too much of a detox too quickly. And it can, especially like when they're in the acute healing from, you know, a physical wound of the surgery, um, it can be too much for their body. So your body is going to start naturally detoxing as soon as you remove the ground zero offender. Uh, that's our body's amazing ability to heal itself. Uh, so supporting your body's ability to heal, not necessarily pushing extra detox, I think is important in the beginning. Um, even doing like rigorous green juices and things like that can push detox too much. So I would just say to focus on like the basics, you know, vitamin C, um, zinc, uh, stuff like that. And then once you get further away from it, glutamine, stuff like that. Um, once you get further away from, from the initial explant, you can start adding in things you know, to support the liver and, and, you know, maybe help with some of the, a, a, a big problem I see post explant is like ex estrogen dominance causing um, a lot of depression and a lot of just, you know, um, lack, like them feeling unhopeful. And uh, I, I believe that it's because these chemicals start circulating that have been lodged in tissue over many years. And then um, they are, they're, you know, mimicking estrogens and causing and pushing these hormonal imbalances. So uh, that can be a little bit difficult. There's ups and downs in the healing process and it can make these women who've been sick for so long and they're like, finally, I removed my implants and then they you know, usually feel better and then sometimes they feel worse and then they feel better and it just starts to become this roller coaster over like a year to two years. And if, if they're dealing with, with other things, like other things that aren't being addressed, then, then that can... You know, I think it, that it, ties a little bit into like an emotional, you know, there's an emotional healing that has to come from that too. I mean, you're losing, a, you know, you, you got breast, for most people, you get breast plants for a reason. And when you lose that, you're losing a little piece of you that the reason you got it. And so there, there's maybe some self-esteem issues that go with it. And then uh, healing from the surgery itself. I mean, I'm sure that there is a, a healing emotionally that has to occur too as well. 
Yes, absolutely. And when you're already feeling that way as a woman and then you have exogenous estrogen circulating everywhere, like, yeah, it's a nightmare. Um, there's a really good support group called Healing Breast Implant Illness by Nicole on Facebook. And she also has a website. And Nicole is this really inspirational woman who's turned this into a nonprofit and she helps so many women. Her husband's a medical doctor. Um, and she has just dedicated like everything to this. And that support group is phenomenal. So I think it has like 50,000 members now. Um, yeah. And so that's a great place. Like everyone who's dealing with this should definitely be in that support group because they're going to have constant questions all the time that they can't ask their practitioner. Um, and they can go in the group and they can read about other people's experiences and the, the women in the community are super ready to help. So. Yeah. So I, I think it's, it's incredible that somebody's put together that kind of type of support group. I thought, I think it's also kind of it's disturbing that there's 50,000 people in that group potentially, which means there's a lot of people that are being impacted this by the about 300,000 to 500,000 a year get implants. Wow. Holy cow. Yeah. It is crazy to some degree that something that we're, that's toxic, that's a foreign substance of the body uh, is put into the body with a little bit less regard but we are, it seems like we're way more concerned sometimes about natural substances that we put into the body, vitamins, nutrients, um, even stem cells that, that are now is a big piece of, of, or a growing portion of healthcare. It takes a lot, gets a lot more scrutiny than something that's an abnormal substance yeah. into the tissue. It's, it's, it's kind of- Yes, yes. Like, so, yes, like, oh my God, you might have a histamine response from your stem cells when they get put back in. Like, are you kidding me? Like, and, and talking about these low levels of heavy metals in isolation to say, like, when we learn about the side effects of an acute lead exposure, right? So we're thinking about what those are. But like, what about the, the cumulative effect of all these different heavy metals together at once? Like, what is the, what is the, the, the list of side effects that you should look for? Right. Nobody's documenting that. And that's the same problem with a lot of the medications we take. Nobody's, somebody's doing studies on their medication. They're not saying yeah. if you're taking these six medications together. What's the impact on that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's not what's being required. So that's the, right. that's a big issue. Nobody, most people are not taking one, one drug by itself, right? They're taking, over time, they're taking a cumulative amount of drugs plus all the other stresses. And that's, creates the what we call the load right this allostatic mm -hmm. load that shifts the phy physiology in the body down regulates thyroid physiology or alters thyroid physiology and alter it alters blood sugar physiology and, and so many other processes so i think it's there's work to be done and it's a good thing there's voices like like ours like yours that are speaking out about some of these things and and making more people aware that hey this is just another toxin that we're putting into our system that can disrupt your system. And while there's no uh, clear flag that the FDA or anybody else is saying, hey, this is the problem and this is how you're gonna know, um, the issue is we have to start to not necessarily say, hey, it's gonna be one thing that creates illness, but the potential accumulation of things. And I, I think the other thing that you, that you said earlier, which I think is really important, for our listeners to understand is if you're not well and if you're chronically sick and you're struggling, one of the best things you can do is do your own timeline. And that is to write out your, your health history, your health story from as early as you can remember to current. And it may seem like, oh, I don't want to do that. It's a lot of work. But what I noticed from my patients is that they'll make their initial list of their timeline and then they'll, they, they keep going back and making additions to it. Additions yeah, because they forget. <laughs> oh yeah, that ulcer I had. Oh yeah. Right. Like. <laughs> and then by the time it gets to us, right, they're going, hey, I realized that my problem started and you go, right, that's why we're doing this. Right. See when health problems started, and then we can look at this isn't a two two year thing or a two month thing. This is a twenty year problem. You are actually having functional problems in your health. Yeah. At the time you were little, right? Starting with your cesarean. <laughs> right. Early, um, early. Yeah, and I think that that's so important to bring up too because my patients already have that when they come to me. They've seen enough people, and if you bring a timeline like that to your insurance medical doctor. 
they're going to tell you that you're crazy. Like they're going to diagnose you with some sort of like somatic narcissism in their head. Right. And then they're approaching you like, Oh, this person who's has all, you know, <laughs> we, have a, we have a significant challenge in allopathic medicine. Allopathic medicine is fantastic at acute crisis care. I mean, we have one of the best models in the world. The problem is we're not, we stink in healthcare, right? And so the issue is most of the testing is based on disease management and disease and pathology testing and not on health. And, and we, we can't even come up with a we can't even come up with a good definition of what health or what healthcare actually is. So how do we start helping people with that, right? And so the model, in the allopathic model is just not set up around um, health. It's about disease management and medications and surgery. And so sometimes we ask somebody in allopathic medicine to give us to say, hey, shouldn't you look at this differently? Well, th this is what they learned and this is what they were taught and this is what all their peers are doing. They're probably going to continue. To yeah, do. they can't look at it differently because if they if they create a, a practice of, of of avoiding the gold standard medication, then they're going to lose their license. Like their board is going to look at them, and their peers are going to say, "No, I would have given them metformin. That's the gold standard. Why didn't you do that?" Okay, so you spent ten years and a plus in school, and how much money? And now you're going to lose your license. So where's the incentive for them to think outside of the pharmaceutical box? There isn't. Right. And that's absolutely right. I mean, I did a post the other day, I think on Instagram, why don't doctors run a reverse T3? And, you know, so people get mad at their allopathic physician. And, and to some degree, I have to defend them. They are working within the guidelines of what insurance and their peer group, right? What's the standard of practice is. And if the standard of practice is not to run it because it doesn't help you with uh, treatment or diagnosis, then they're going to get their hand slapped if they're running it, right? And so it is just a different model. I think for many people who are struggling with chronic health issues, they just have to start to realize that what they're searching for, a healthier life, improved function, improved quality of life, probably is not going to be found in that allopathic insurance-based model. They're probably going to have to step outside that model because it's, the model is just not adapted to help people get healthy, true health, get off medications. It's all about medications and surgeries, not actually achieving uh, health without those things. Yeah, I think that's important. Insurance is, is meant to keep you alive, not to get your health back. Um, and, and spinning off of that, you know, people who decide that they're going to get breast implants, you know, obviously that's, that's an out-of-pocket expense and they often save you know, thousands of dollars to be able to do that or put it on care credit or, you know, financing it over a long period of time, you know, and then maybe a year down the road, they realize that this is making them sick. I'm assuming that the insurance companies do not pay for those to be removed. And that's another out of pocket expense that the patient would then have to, you know, find the money if they were already, you know, counting pennies to be able to pay for this in the beginning, and then to have to pay for this to be removed. And if, you know, there's obviously probably a large, you know, just probably about the same amount of money that it costs to put them in to take them out, if not. Yeah. Even. And in some cases more, because if you're, if you have a rupture on MRI, sometimes insurance will pay for it. It depends on the type of insurance you have. Um, if you can prove that you have a rupture or a, um, in some cases, a capsular contracture, which is when that scar tissue capsule will kind of like tighten up which we think is related to pathogen activity. But anyways, um, sometimes the insurance will pay for it. There was also, and may still be a fund, uh, there was a, a, a lot of money from this anonymous fund that they were giving women like up to $5,000 who explanted. And the rumor was that this fund was part of a settlement from the original lawsuits when the FDA took it off the market. Um, and it was money coming from the manufacturer of silicone Dow Corning. Um, and yeah, some women were getting money. I think you can still apply. Uh, I just don't know how much funds they have left. And also, if you have a rupture, if you have a rupture documented by an MRI, you can get warranty claim money from the manufacturer if you sign something saying that you won't sue. Huh. You, can get, you can get about $3,500. So if you can prove that there was a dysfunction with your implant and you sign away your rights to pursue them legally, they'll give you the warranty money. So. 
Interesting. Good. Hmm. Good to know. That, makes me, that makes me think about that for a second, why that's occurring. But anyway, that's a whole nother day. So if we had, so let's, most of the listeners of our podcast are struggling with some type of kind of chronic hypothyroid symptoms. Many of them have been told they're nuts, they're crazy, they're lazy because their TSH is normal and their, and their T4 is normal. Uh, we talk about one of the, <laughs> that could trigger that Hype, chronic hypothyroid symptomatology and that cellular hypothyroidism, breast implants, you would say, could be one of those things, right? Absolutely. And if, if you have them, it is, uh, it's probably a really important thing to seek out somebody who is really uh, well studied on taking these things out and supporting you pre and post implant. Correct. Yes, absolutely. So I want to, I think this was, there's a lot of information in this podcast. We appreciate you coming on. Uh, I'm going to have to go back and think about a bit about what we talked about a little bit more. Uh, I'm definitely going to consider uh, even more than I thought about before breast implants and patients that are coming in and struggling with chronic health issues. Um, but can you give, if somebody's interested in uh, seeing more about you, your pod, your, your show uh, that you do, your TV show, or just consulting with you. We're going to put your information on, on the podcast notes, but um, where would you tell them to, that they can find you? Um, well, I post a lot of health information on Instagram, which is my handle, which you can provide. It's D-R-K-A-Y-T-E. And on my Instagram, there's a link to my website. So if they want to email me, they can do that from there. Fantastic. And the name of your TV show is it, where? Oh. Is it? <laughs> um, I host a TV show in West Hollywood called Mind Body Spirit, and it's kind of like I interview a lot of people about their wellness journey and their uh, spiritual journey and stuff like that. So. <laughs> And that's on uh, Focus TV Network, and we share a lot of that on Instagram and YouTube and Vimo and Apple Podcasts. So. Awesome. Well, we, I appreciate you coming on. Dr. Erica, any last questions or you got what you need? No, I think, I think it was a great podcast, a lot of information. I commend you for you know, spreading the word and you know, trying to let people know that this is a thing we should be looking at or even just you know, making awareness to it that not only patients looking for it, but maybe, you know, maybe there's some doctors out there listening who, you know, maybe they will start to look at their patients that way, or just bringing awareness to the medical community that, you know, they need to acknowledge that this is something that, that could be happening and creating, you know, illness and disease in our patients' lives. Yes. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Brilliantly said, Dr. Erica, and Dr. Kate, you did a fantastic job. So we're going to sign off today. So if anybody has any questions, uh, just reach out to any one of us um, through our contact information, which will all be at the end of the show notes. So take care, ladies. Have a great day, okay? Yeah, thank you. Bye. <laughs>